Pfizer is testing a new pill that could help treat patients with COVID-19. We asked Dr. Neha Narula with Stanford Healthcare about that trial and some of the other latest coronavirus headlines. Yes, indeed. So Pfizer recently announced that they have begun the early stages of a clinical trial looking at this new antiviral. Um, and the name is PF07321332. Um, and it, it's known as a protease inhibitor, um, which is to be taken at the first sign of a COVID infection. Now, the way this medication works is that it binds to and blocks a viral enzyme called protease that is responsible for viral replication within our cells. And so while this particular antiviral is new, we've actually had very effective and therapeutic medications, um, antivirals in particular, that have been used and that are currently being used um, against viruses like HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and they're very effective uh, and they work in similar mechanisms. So it's definitely getting a lot of buzz as a possible treatment for those who do end up contracting COVID. Um, and this comes at a, at a very um, uh, important time because we are now seeing this third surge in Europe. We're now seeing rising numbers of variants. Um, and so while vaccines are still the most effective way to prevent COVID, uh, along with you know, our social distancing, hand washing, um, in order to tackle this pandemic successfully, not only are we going to need preventative strategies, but also effective therapeutics. Um, and so this particular medication, we are eagerly anticipating the results of the clinical trials because an effective treatment um, will help us put this pandemic behind us, um, help prevent severe COVID infections, help prevent severe uh, complications. And so i um, super excited to hear more about this. In our last segment, we had talked about the AstraZeneca vaccine and the possible link to blood clotting, the rare instances of blood clotting. Do we know any more about that now? So yes, um, as you mentioned, you know, several countries in Europe, uh, we talked about this last week, um, paused their vaccine rollout. Um, and the number is now around 30 reported blood clots following AstraZeneca vaccine um, being administered across Europe and mostly in women under the age of 55. Now we don't have conclusive data on causation, but there were two groups, um, one in Norway and one in Germany that independently um, examined uh, patients within their own respective countries and found that these clots are possibly due to the vaccine triggering an autoimmune response that is overactivating cells in our bodies called platelets. Now, platelets are important. Um, they do help us, you know, whenever we get a cut or a scrape, they help prevent us from bleeding out. They create clots um, so that we don't bleed out. Um, but what we're seeing is that these vaccines may be triggering a response within our body that's overactivating these cells, creating unnecessary clots. Um, and so we have to remember these, these um, research uh, studies are not yet published or peer reviewed. Um, and so we will have to continue to follow up on these studies. Um, but if there is some basis, if there's some truth to their findings, the good news is that we can identify these particular adverse effects and treat them um, very effectively. And so as you mentioned, this is a very rare complication. Um, uh, we have to remember that it is about 30 patients in millions. Um, so it is it's super rare. Um, it's a very small percentage. And um, in, in the millions of people that have suffered from um, severe complications, hospitalizations, and deaths, we are seeing that this small percentage um, does not uh, allow us to say this is um, super risky to take this vaccine. In fact, the WHO and the uh, European Medicines Agency have both um, stated that the benefits of this particular vaccine tremendously outweigh the risk. And speaking of uh, vaccines and safety, is it safe for uh, pregnant women to get vaccinated? Yes, so exciting research was actually just published this past week in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And um, they were, uh, this particular group of women was um, studied in big centers like MGH, um, Mass General, Brigham and Women's Hospital, MIT, Harvard. Um, and what they looked at uh, was the antibody response in 130 women, of which 84 were pregnant, 
31 were lactating, and they compared them to um, non-pregnant vaccinated individuals. And what they found was that the vaccines elicited equivalent um, antibody levels in both groups. Additionally, the more information that was found were that these mothers were actually passing these antibodies on to their newborns. Um, so, uh, the sufficient antibody levels were found in breast milk and placenta. And this is a fantastic finding because the first few months is such a vulnerable time period for newborns. And so having this extra protection through the antibodies being passed on from their mothers um, is just a relief to know because they will have some protection against COVID. Um, additionally, um, there were no uh, more side effects in this particular group of women than the general public. So it's a very inspiring and positive study, um, mostly because you know in initial clinical trials Trials, pregnant women are not included. And we know that pregnancy is an increased risk for severe COVID infections, complications, and adverse outcomes such as preterm birth. So overall, very, very exciting. Um, and I think it, it reassures us as a medical community that we can effectively offer these vaccines to our um, pregnant uh, patients. So we were talking about long haulers, and we know that some people really suffer some effects um, long after contracting COVID. And there's a new study that's taking a closer look at that. Do we know any more on um, what that study shows? Yeah, so when the pandemic started as a medical community, we were expecting some long-term consequences of COVID, just given the number of ICU stays, hospitalizations, and the severe complications we were seeing. What we didn't expect were to have long-term consequences in patients in mild to moderate um, infections that were um, being seen on an outpatient setting. Um, and so... Uh, Symptoms like fatigue, body aches, brain fog, chest pain, they were being reported anecdotally or through grassroots efforts. Um, and, and recent research is now estimating that about 10 to 30 percent of infected COVID patients will suffer from these prolonged symptoms or what we're calling long COVID. Um, and now with more than 30 million cases, just taking that that uh, lower end of that range, you're still looking at millions of people being affected by these long um, COVID symptoms. And this is where Dr. Mehta and Dr. Lau from Johns Hopkins have come to organize and actually recently launched um, the largest study looking at this particular group of patients, that are the long hauler patients. And the study is called COVID Long Study, and they're hoping to recruit about 25,000 patients. Um, at this point, we know they've had about a quarter patients um, a quarter of that number uh, register already. Um, they're continuing to kind of gather the information about their demographics, their health history, their initial COVID symptoms, their long hauler symptoms, and they're going to be um, analyzing that to better understand this disease. Um, and not only just what they've experienced, but also the trajectories going forward. And so we don't have any um, data as of now, um, but we're hoping to learn so much from, from this large study that's going to be coming out of Johns Hopkins. So more to come on that. 